Well, I normally say welcome to the podcast for one person, but we've got three guests on today. So welcome everyone on the podcast. Thank uh, you. Good to be here. <laughs> can we can we introduce who we've got then? Okay, I'll start then. My name's Steve Colclough. I have 35 years in the Environment Agency, now a semi-retired consultant, but I also chair a specialist section of the Institute of Fisheries Management, looking at marine estuary and fisheries. Fantastic. Thanks, Steve. And, and I'm Jenny Murray. I'm the Senior Restorations Project Manager at Blue Marine Foundation. So I've been working there about a year and a half now, and um, I oversee our restoration program of all our projects in the UK we have currently. I think we have about five at the moment, um, including the Sturgeon project. Uh, and before that, I worked uh, at Natural England uh, on marine conservation advice and a bit in fisheries policy at DEFRA as well for a couple of years. Great. And I'm Hannah McCormick. I'm a conservation project officer at the Zoological Society of London. And I'm in the estuaries and wetlands team. We work on a range of UK based projects. Um, and I've worked across a range of different projects, um, including State of the Thames and other fish based um, projects that we have going on. So now a lot of my time is dedicated to sturgeon. So basically, we've got the crack team for UK, uh, the, the A team of sturgeon for the UK, essentially, to try and get these back. So if you, if you want to just explain, or whoever's best to explain, um, what the UK Sturgeon Alliance is, a bit of a mouthful, but what, what is it? OK, it's probably best if I start uh, with this, because I can give you a quick history. Um, I've been gathering data on sturgeon for 18 years now. Uh, and this starts with a discussion in France in 2006, where the French and Germans collectively are trying to restore Acupentasturio. But what they realise is this, because this animal can travel very long distances, individual animals were being taken by French, British, Belgian trawlers every now and again, and nobody knows what to do with them. They die, they get given to the Crown, Natural History Museum. But all the French were saying, for heaven's sake, put them back in the water. They're some of the last ones. Uh, this is a species which once ranged across the whole Atlantic face of Europe and the last spawning population was the Gironde and by 2006 they hadn't had a natural spawning for 20 years. So they're getting concerned that there's less than three, 400 fish in the wild uh, and what to do about that. Um, so our discussion started from that. Um, I slowly developed a database. Quite quickly the French said, hang on Steve, some of the ones you're seeing recently came from the only stocking that we have done. So what we realized then is here's a migratory species that, unlike the salmon, strays more and can travel very long distances. Um, so basically that database is built up and it got to the point by 2019 where talking to colleagues in ZSL, Blue Marine Foundation, Seven Rivers Trust, we decided to get together and form the UK Sturgeon Alliance. So we are the go-to organization about sturgeon conservation in this country. And we're becoming recognised by DEFRA, Natural England and others in that regard. Wow, it's pretty, I mean, I guess it's exciting because it's a, it's quite a charismatic species. I mean, as much as I love my Burbot and I bang on about Burbot, uh, a sturgeon's a pretty, a pretty express, uh, impressive animal when you get to see one uh, close up. Hopefully. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I saw one. Um, so we've, we've just been recently over to Germany to see the hatchery facilities um, that the, the, for the reintroduction program. And that's the first time I'd, I'd seen sturgeon before. And um, actually very beautiful species. I think a lot of, lot of people, um, you know, when they think of sturgeon originally, they can grow huge over five metres, I think. So, um, uh, yeah, a lot of people, I think, probably think they're a bit scary, but, you know, scary looking, but um, they're actually very beautiful. I really like them. <laughs> five five metres, did you say? Yeah, I think so. They, they, well, they can grow over to up to a hundred years, um, and yeah, over five meters. I don't know um, in the UK what the largest one from the records that we've we've had here. But even, well, you, you see know. some of the old black and white pictures, don't you, of um, of them, and like they're bigger than the anglers. Put it that way. I mean, they're they're pretty pretty yeah, chunky. So there, there is a classic picture of a fish taken at um, taking the Towie. Uh, a place called Nangaradeg, a uh, deep pool there in 1933. And that's probably the photograph you're thinking of. It's a classic one. Yeah. It's three and a half metres long. It weighs 388 pounds. Wow. Uh, and, the, and the interesting thing with that one is it was foul hooked. And as it's hauled out the water, it's dripping eggs. 
Uh, oh. According to international experts, they can only extrude eggs from the body when they're within 24, 48 hours of actually spawning. Uh, so that's a really interesting, interesting piece of evidence in its own right. What what year was that? Sorry again, Steve. Nineteen thirty-three. Okay, so they we so there's there's reason to believe then that up until the early twentieth century they were still having a go at spawning in the UK. That's a really way good way of describing it, Jack. Having a go. What we have <laughs> is a lot, of, a very a good lot of evidence. It's worth saying that our historic database is now five thousand plus animals since eighteen hundred. So 1700. Now, a lot of that is now coming from searchable newspaper archives that go back to 1700. And when you start trawling through that, you see really good patterns in the data that they were coming into some of our lower rivers in small groups at the right time of year to be spawning. Uh, and fish like that one at Nat Nat Garadeg were obviously highly uh, fertile at the time. What we have absolutely zero evidence of is reproduction. We've got no small fish anywhere. But this species, that is characteristic of the species, enigmatic. It doesn't necessarily spawn in every river it runs into. It's sort of looking around. Right. What, what we might have is not a British stock, but a pan-European stock that uses the whole continent. Um, so wow. this is why we have to be working with other nations on this, because nobody can control it. It goes where it likes. Uh, but our evidence shows certainly evidence of intent to spawn. And very recently, our database has been looked at by IUCN, who say, frankly, we can't categorize it as, as, as a native because of its habits. But certainly it is a British species. It is using our waters, or it was in the past, in significant numbers. Uh, we think... to find evidence of reproduction, but that's for the future. Sorry, I just wanted to jump in and just say, I think um, the native question is pretty much... Uh, we're in agreement that it is a native species. It's more about um, the residency or where the, that spawning question, whether it should be assessed as an uh, animal that spawns and sort of spends a lot of time in our waters. So that's kind of where the question is. But we've been gratified to hear lots of people agree that it is seen as a UK native species, which is what we believe as well. So. Yeah, no, that, yeah, that makes sense. And you mentioned what, because like the thing with these sturgeon is often they've got so many different names. So so what what's the actual, I think you did mention earlier, sorry, but like what's the actual species and, and is that the only species that we get? Oh, no, th this is where it gets complicated, Jack. All oh, right, okay, let's go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> pin your ears back. Okay, um, the, the species I spoke of that was across the whole Atlantic face of Europe is Acapensa sturio, the common or sea sturgeon. Okay. Now, uh, we had thought that was the only one native to the Atlantic coast of Europe until about 2000, when the Germans doing a lot of genetic analysis found that the stock in the Baltic had a different genetic makeup, which was very close to the Atlantic sturgeon, which you find on the east coast of States and in the Gulf. Uh, the speculation uh, now is at some point in the distant past, a population came across possibly via Greenland and established itself in the Baltic. So we now have the French and Germans doing restoration of a French stock from the Gironde, but they're stuck into the Gironde and the Elbe with Acapensa Sturio. And all of the countries in the Baltic are now collaborating on the restoration of Acapensa oxyrhynchus, which is this Atlantic sturgeon. To make it even more complex, we have good evidence of both of those species in the past history of the UK and in modern animals that are turning up today, coming from both sources in English waters, coastal waters. Right. So there's two species, and that's interesting. There are two species there, definitely. Yeah. Ah, are they are they easy to tell apart, or have you got to be a bit of a no. sturgeon aficionado? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, they're not. Uh, and in fact, many people would were saying until relatively recently, oh, you've got to do genetic analysis on this to tell the difference. Don't right. Do in fact, there are small morphological differences that you can see in the field. And we rely heavily on European experts who can identify virtually every fish from a good photograph okay. down to its species. So we are very careful to get every fish looked at by one of our colleagues in either France or Germany and saying, which one is it? I personally can now tell the difference if they're closer together. 
Yeah, and I was going to say. If, by itself, it's difficult. Yeah. If they're next to each other, then it's a bit easier. But I, yeah, we had a record come through um, uh, recently and um, uh, through our through our website. And um, uh, I was trying, I was really trying to work out, see if it was a native or not. But so I'll send it over to the European experts. But it's so much easier when it's three hour and the two are together or two pictures together. That's the the slippery slope of fish ID, isn't it? It can be um, with some species, it can be an absolute nightmare. So I was going to say, when did we last have them in the UK? But it sounds like we we have lost them, but we haven't because they do occasionally turn up. And some like we just mentioned, then a record came in recently. So like, I suppose it depends how you want to define it. Like if if we're talking potential spawning, I'm assuming that's early 20th century. But if we're on about the odd record, we still get them or we don't. Right. The, 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 if you look at the, the, the history of this over time, we were still getting them occasionally into the early 20th century. I mentioned one in 1933. Yeah. Uh, there's a real gap in records after about 1950, 55, that sort of time. What you then start to pick up is these animals originating from French and German restoration. Now, that actively started in the late 80s. Uh, it's been really picking up since 2007. And what we're now seeing is fish from the 2007 class and a bit later um, starting to appear in our coastal waters. Now, a fish of, say, a metre long is seven years old. They don't leave the estuary till they get to 50 centimetres, about three years old. So we're seeing the first generation of French and German fish coming back to coastal waters in the UK. They haven't penetrated the estuaries very far yet. But one intriguing thing is they're being taken in areas where the past history suggests they were there. Because of these 5,000 plus records, three and a half thousand are from coastal waters. Right. And there's enough information in that to show that they were commonly taken in particular places. Now, unlike the salmon, when it puts out to sea, it doesn't just vanish off the Greenland. It stays on the coastal shelf. And its prime feeding habitat is sandy, muddy areas for things like ragworm. So wherever you've got that in the mouths of estuaries and around the coast, that's where they feed. So we have records of where they used to be. And intriguingly, the few records we've had, it's only 17 fish since 2015, but they're turning up in the same places where they used to be. So we're already starting a discussion with people like the MMO about the future here with things like marine protected areas. Because um, Acupensasturio has more conservation labels than the black rhino does. You know, these extremely rare and threatened species, but people haven't thought of fish as being that important in conservation no. in the UK before. And interestingly, like um, as Steve was saying, that a lot of the records are coming up in certain areas, particularly around the southwest coast of, of England. Our most recent record, I, I believe, was in April 2022, I think, Steve, um, unless we've had one after that, which was in the northeast coast, um, which is quite interesting. Yeah, the most recent uh, Sturio confirmed was uh, May 22, uh, coming into Brixham. Uh, wow. that's, a, that's, that's another interesting point in its own right, is that they started to appear in greater and greater numbers. And we have to coordinate a lot better in the future. And this is something that uh, we'll be concentrating on working with both UK and continental regulators to make sure we are properly recording what is being caught and what happened to it. Now, what we want is a good photograph, some metrics, and please put it back in the water. That's happening in a number of instances, but not in every instance. Uh, and in some cases, we're getting good photographs, but we don't know precisely where it was caught. It's really important we have this data going forward. I suppose when you say that there's literally maybe only a few hundred of these, every fish is is so incredibly valuable then, isn't it? Like you say, if it's in a trawl or an angler's caught it, or whether it's it's imperative that it goes back you know, safely. Exactly. And people don't realise what they're looking at. And one of my concerns, not concerns, one of the issues that look, look at the past history is when they come into the rivers, and they will start to do that, in the past, because the animal had been gone so long, they were persecuted. If they weren't caught by salmon fishermen 200 years ago in the mouth of the estuary, the few that got past were very visibly and slowly swimming up maybe a small river. They were picked on by people who pitchforked them, shot them, with shotguns, hold them out the water because they thought they're exotic sea monsters. They're going to eat all their salmon. So public environmental education is key going forward because people will start to see them. Am I am I right in thinking they don't, or when they're when they're running up to breed, they don't eat in fresh water, or is that a myth? No, that that seems to be the truth. 
Um, uh, Acupentasturio and oxyrhynchus are feeding on crustaceans and ragworms and the like. But as soon as they start to penetrate up, they don't seem to feed. So um, any, any anglers thinking it's going to be like Canada on the Fraser River, then are going to have a, a sad uh, a sad truth to that then? That's an interesting point. I mentioned that one taken at Mount Garadeg. All of the angling records in our record database are all foul hooked. When they were taken um, us. Um, we do have several records of uh, long lining for cod at sea. So in other words, if they're in the marine environment and they're feeding, they're vulnerable to a yeah. hook. Uh, but probably not in fresh waters. No, that makes that makes sense. So, what do we know? What caused the decline for them then? Um, like, why why have we seen this this decline in numbers for sturgeon in in British waters? Well, this is really why this species is such an iconic um, an iconic one. Um, here you have an animal that uh, 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 has already been described. It lives for maybe a hundred years. It's not mature till it's sixteen to eighteen years old. It doesn't reach its peak maturity till it's 50 years old. Wow. Um, you move in small groups together. They're very visible. So even though they weren't um, taken by, say, salmon fish 200 years ago, they were easy to catch. And 200 years ago, people didn't understand anything about caviar. It was still a prized food item. The Germans were eating smoked sturgeon as a speciality heavily in the, with fish coming from the Elbe estuary until about um, 1900. And in 1880, they were still catching 4,000 fish a year, adults and little ones, and killing them all. The fishery just crashed. But if you go back further in time, this is a migratory species that can't leap like a salmon. So from the from the Middle Ages onwards, as soon as we started to create weirs and, and blocks and such structures uh, and mills and the like, we were removing their spawning habitat. So the populations have been reducing since then. Then pollution comes along, and then overfishing, both in rivers and at sea. So it, as, as a migrator, it's probably the best indicator one would have of a pristine circumstance. And that's a very, very long time ago. So it's a multi-pronged attack, basically, on uh, on yeah. sturgeon like, like many others. So, so Jenny, what, what's Blue, <clears throat> Blue Marine Foundation hoping to achieve with this then? So, so we started looking at um, sturgeon... Um, restoration work in, I think it was about, it was before I started that blue actually, it was about 2019, 2020, and um, we started looking at the seven, the seven area, the Bristol Channel region, because that's sort of what Steve said earlier, one of the strongest, um, I guess, areas for one of the highest data sets, I think it's around just over 250-ish you know, um, yeah. records up there. Um, so yeah, one of the, one of the biggest strongholds. And um we were looking at re, uh, European sturgeon, so we wanted to see whether the area, I guess, was suitable for um, sturgeon spawning. Um, if you know whether that's through reintroduction programs or whether that's through just them coming back naturally, um, we wanted to um, look into that. So we worked with the um, University of Plymouth, um, a student, MSc um, dissertation student there, and she carried out. Um, she worked with us to look at the, fe the, the feasibility. So. So with Steve, I think was there as well, and a colleague of mine, Rory, um, and uh, Alex, who, who no longer works at Blue, but um, they did some visual assessments up some of the um, rivers in the Bristol Channel. So the Y, um, I think you particularly looked at the Y, but we also assessed um, the Towie, the Severn. We didn't look at Usk because the, the records there weren't very strong and it's kind of covered in, um, there's lots of barriers up that, that estuary, that river. So, um, so yeah, so that's, what um, that program of work looked at, um, we found um, from uh, from desktop records, uh, desktop studies, and that visual assessment um, that that area could potentially be suitable. And um, there isn't very many barriers. Well, there isn't any barriers on the Y, I don't think. Um, you think well, you've got unlocking the seven, haven't you? As well, yes, exactly. cleared the path for you. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, suitable gravel, you know, the like mixed gravel, um, clean gravel beds. Um, and we did some eDNA studies as well, um, looking at food availability. So there was, I think, found a lot of polychaete worms there, which I believe they feed on. Um, and visual assessments looked at um, crustaceans and, um, you know, little things that they can feed on um, when they get a bit larger. Um, so that was yeah really interesting. There's a lot more work that needs to be done in in that area, and now we're working as part of the UK Sturgeon Alliance to look at that um, on a on a national scale. I'm sure Hannah will 
Um, it's done loads of work on this recently with, uh, with others as well. So um, I could let her talk about that. But that's kind of where we've got to. So as I said, there's a lot of work that we need to do specifically in the seven. Also thinking about people's perceptions. Um, as Steve was saying earlier, you know, what anglers think about sturgeon coming back to UK, but back to our rivers um, and um, further eDNA monitoring probably on food availability. So there's a little bit more work needs to be done. But Hannah, did you want to expand on that from what we're doing nationally? Yeah, sure. So the first thing we decided as a Sturgeon Alliance that would be um, good to kind of organize and collect our, our, our efforts and collaborate together was an action plan. So we have the UK Sturgeon Action Plan draft, which um, should be published later in the spring um, this year. So keep an eye out for that. And that will be a sort of a longer term um, sort of 10 year document laying out what uh, intended actions we have towards sturgeon conservation in the UK. And those sorts of actions include um, uh, working with the fishing industry and recreational fishers to understand how we can better support them to, um, you know, have the proper care and guidance um, so that we can make sure that we're getting any records that possibly come in because that's our one source of data at the moment is is when they're caught in commercial vessels um, as well as the proper guidance for what to do if you do catch sturgeon putting it back as well as um, habitat protection and conservation potentially restoration if necessary but kind of scaling up what Jenny described those kinds of suitability studies in different um, areas of the UK to see where the suitable sturgeon habitats are so that's an example of just some of the actions that will be included in that action plan. But one of the actions that we will be taking forward this year is looking at um, what sort of the next, what the next step, what the most, uh, th that collection of actions is kind of a longer term thing, as I said, but we want to know what is the next thing that we need to do now, because as we described, these both species are, are incredibly, they, they need our help in, in Europe and particularly the European surgeon globally is critically endangered. So that needs, needs our action now. So we just want to know what is the next step. One of the things to consider is reintroduction because that's, that's what's been happening on the continent. Um, we know that they've had um, starting to see some success with those reintroductions. Again, as Steve described, they take a while to, to gather the data to know whether because these species are so long lived. So we're starting to see that those are successful. So that's one thing that we have been considering. Um, but we, as we know, we can't just jump straight into reintroduction of a species. There's a lot that needs to be considered. And one of the ways to go about that and approach that question, conservation question and kind of figure out what is the next best step is through that something called a structured decision-making process. And that's suggested by the IUCN as, um, and by the DEFRA reintroductions code as the best approach to deciding whether reintroduction is the best conservation intervention. Um, so we at ZSL have, in, in the Institute of Zoology, we have um, some of members of the IUCN translocation specialist group who we've been working closely with and who have been helping us guide us towards this starting what's called the structured decision making process, which is a decision and analysis tool essentially considering all um, uncertainty as well as the, the data that we have, but also taking into account the opinions, the values of stakeholders impacted by potential conservation decisions. Um, so this is a process that we're going to be starting in the next few months um, and it will be a year long process including workshops and um, lots of consultation with experts and stakeholders, and then lots of modeling of the, the evidence and the data that we have to see with different potential sturgeon interventions, including um, habitat restoration, habitat conservation, um, waiting to see what happens with those European populations or mm -hmm. reintroductions, um, what sort of has the best conservation outcomes and what achieves the objectives and meets the the um, sort of the the views and the values of those stakeholders involved. So that's something that is 
coming very soon. And that will be um, a lot of my focus over the next year, at least. Well, you look at, you know, rewilding, certainly in the last sort of 10 years, it's become like almost trendy with people, you know, talking about yeah. beavers and lynx and all this kind of charismatic uh, megafauna on land. And often the freshwater stuff can can get left behind. But I mean, you, I don't think you can argue that a sturgeon is a charismatic <laughs> animal. It's It's an incredible creature. So... I mean, it might be too early days to know this for sure then, but would the idea then be to kind of take some of these captive bred fish from Europe and introduce them straight to British rivers? Or would it be more of a case that you'd bring some over and try and breed them and rear them yourself? Or is it too early to, to say that yet? I think it'd be too early to say, but I I think before anything, if if this reintroduction intervention was decided to be the best way forward after this this process that we'll go through um then a trial would be the best way to start okay. um before sort of fully jumping in um but yeah like beyond that i think it's way too early to tell i don't know if yeah. jenny and steve have anything to add <laughs> <laughs> and it, yes. one, one thing we can add is it is obviously we're not doing this in isolation we're working closely with our french and german colleagues yeah so we can learn from their experiences um, that's very valuable. They're very supportive of what we're trying to achieve, and we uh, very much welcome that. Uh, the first, for example, with their uh, the fish they've been stocking, the first adults started to return to both the Gironde and the Elbe last year. It's as recent as that. They've got no evidence yet of spawning in situ, but it, this is the start of a long process. Yeah. So they're just watching what happens next, and then we can feed on from that. It's a lot of learning that we'll take from um, European colleagues as well. So it's really great to um, engage with them and, and learn from them. And um, yeah, it allows us to think about all the other considerations we need to think about um, for this national action plan as well. Well, it's so useful, isn't it? Because you've kind of got them, for lack of a better word, doing the legwork. And it just means that you, when you do want to actually, you know, put this into action, you've got a good bit of research and, and knowledge to um, to draw from. So it's it's fantastic what they're um, what they're doing with with the um, sturgeon when they do successfully spawn then do the juveniles do they just head straight back out to sea do they hang around in the river like what's um, what's the life cycle like they drop quickly down to the estuary uh, the two okay. species are slightly different uh, but it, it, in general they're not leaving the estuary till they're about three years old right uh, about 50 centimeters uh, but even then, they may hang around in the coastal waters. They don't. One of the issues here, and it's a challenge to all of us across Europe, is nobody has a large extant population to study. No. We're all looking at the history of this and watching the progress of what's starting to happen and working with each other. But none of us can predict the future. Um, so that's part of the challenge. Yeah, because I. So really, if anglers are likely to catch one, it's going to be the estuary, isn't it? If it's like a legit capture. Well, just talking about the anglers, it strays onto another mm -hmm. subject, but it's worth mentioning here. Anglers are catching them. If you look in the angling press, they're catching them in stillwater lakes and freshwater rivers, but not these two species. And this no. is widely part of a problem, and it's a problem across Western Europe. And it's so important that even an August buddy like OSPAR, the Oslo Paris Commission, has said if we're trying to restore species like sturgeon, probably the biggest threat to them is alien species. Now, this is where parallel sets of regulations that weren't intended to cross over do because of human nature. And under the um, oh, ILFA regulations from 1980, the Inland Fishery um, regulations, um, DEFRA provides licenses. Now, one of those licenses is for uh, the pet trade to bring in sturgeon for the, for the pet trade. And then the public can go and buy them and put them in their garden pond. But the intention is that they only go into discrete bodies of water, no bigger than an acre, and always fully enclosed and on private premises, and you're not fishing for them. By As soon as these regulations came about in the early uh, part of this, uh, 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 just after the uh, millennium, it became apparent in a nice paper produced in 2006 to show that three species of imported sturgeon had started to pop up magically in angling lakes all over the south of England. <laughs> the same three species that were on the import list for the pet trade. Now, you couldn't prove the link, but it was quite obvious. Yeah. Um, the current regulation allows any species of Acupensa or Huso, and Huso is the, you know, the, the big beluga sturgeon, to be brought in for the pet trade. But they're bleeding out. 
Now, if they're stocked into an angling lake, it's totally illegal under both UK and European legislation. But nobody knew it was happening, basically. So we now have this reservoir of fish that have gone into angling lakes. Most of them are, are uh, gravel pits in a, on the floodplain, so some of them are washing out into our rivers. Um, and for example, the very fish that um, Jenny mentioned just now, which has come into our website recently, checked out by our German colleague, is actually Acupenta transmontanus, the white sturgeon that you see in the Fraser River. Now that animal will do six meters and 800 kilos and live for over a hundred years. Wow. And what this fish that's just been photographed is probably the same fish photographed three or four times from the river store in Leicestershire. It's still adolescent. It's got to about 80, 90 pounds in weight, but at some point in the next few years, it'll want to go down to the sea because it has the same anadromous habit as uh, Sturio. But we don't need these animals in the wild. Now, in the Stillwater Lake, they are being caught by anglers because they have a slightly different feeding ecology. Um, now, under the, uh, uh, um, uh, the uh, Keeping and Introduction of Fish Regulations of 2015, it has been agreed by government that only certain species could be put legally into lakes for fishing. But there's a whole schedule or part one of that fact which says you cannot do it with certain species, including alien sturgeon species. But we already have them there. So in our view, that legislation needs to be enforced because this problem is going to carry on and getting worse. And there's also an education uh, uh, issue there to be done with the uh, ornamental fish trade, who are very supportive of what we're doing. It's, you know, that these things need to be drawn together, basically. I uh, but one of the way that these aliens are a problem is not just disease, as might be the case with the species. With sturgeon, some of them can hybridize. So yeah. we don't want the aliens out in the wild because of that problem. And that's what OSPAR are concerned about. I suppose we, um, in a way, almost need like tougher regulations because, you know, I, I could just wander out now, go to a uh, pond shop and buy a sturgeon and they've got no evidence that my pond's big enough or, you know, most, but like you say, most of these, stir I think sturlets are the smallest, but they still get pretty big. But like you were saying, some of them get a good two or three metres. I mean, realistically, how many people have a pond big enough to house a couple of sturgeon that size? Well, that's an animal welfare issue. The ornamental trade tell us that, you know, that the retailers are very responsible in telling people this. But we all know people who have a small garden pond who don't really know what they're doing, who may have bought one of these. And two, three years later, it's getting on for a metre in length. And they're thinking, what do I do next? Yeah. We know what to do next. They release it to the wild. They don't try very hard and find somewhere else to house it. So it's not just the angling issue. It's the pet trade itself. We need better education of the general public here. Yeah, certainly on the River Trent near me. I mean, um, so many people catch sturgeon now, and it's always the kind of, oh, I've caught this rare sturgeon. They're coming back. Our rivers are getting cleaner. And it's like, no, you've just caught someone's pet. <laughs> it's it's uh, not. A... It's interesting you say that, Jack, because um, all of the photographs we got from 2010 onwards until the French and German Acupenta Sturio and Oxyrhynchus start to come, all of them were exclusive aliens. Yeah. The, the most obvious one is the Siberian sturgeon, which does, and of course, the, the different, the, the interesting point here, or the, 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 um, the problem we have here is that if an angler catches an, elite, a, a, an alien sturgeon in a river, he doesn't know what species it is. No. So he puts it back in the water, and maybe we get to see a photograph afterwards. But by putting it back in the water, he's actually broken British and European legislation because it's an alien animal. He doesn't know that because he doesn't know which species it is. And identification is complex anyway. So this coming together of these two issues has made it very difficult for everybody. And that that's a common problem across Western Europe. We need more collaboration on these issues. And just on the back, of, just on the back of that as well. So they, they um, uh, the the website that Steve was referring to earlier. That's the Save the Sturgeon website, which you you may have come across. But um, um, so the Alliance of built this website to um, promote or raise awareness of um, sturgeon, its life cycle, you know, um, all of that kind of stuff, but also provides a platform for records to be submitted. So this is how we get our sturgeon sightings coming through. And it's been really great to even get records of non-native species so we can start to build up that picture as well um, and share that information. Um, so so yeah, there's, there's more work that needs to be done around um, uh, raising awareness of that, directing people to the website so that we can um, collect that information and look at look at distributions and across the UK and stuff. So 
um yeah it's been it's been really useful in that sense but sorry Hannah I cut you off I was just gonna add to that too it's it, it all that data is really useful for putting together this picture of where these non-natives are come coming from because there have been also reports of truckloads of sturgeon being brought over from the continent. So um, between that and caviar farms, we don't know if there's there's a few in the UK and potential for, for those to escape into the wild as well. So as much data as we can get on the non-natives and understand where they might be coming from so that we can address it. And as Steve said, kind of get the enforcement that we need. I guess it's tough, isn't it? Because unless you're a hundred percent sure, um, the last thing you want is people harming sturgeon in case it is a native. But then at the same time, I think a lot of anglers would be hard pressed to to kill a large sturgeon. So I don't I don't know what the answer is to be honest. Like if you have caught, I mean, I think te I think from a legal standpoint, if it's non-native, you shouldn't release it back, should you? But um, unless the person knows a hundred percent, I guess it's quite tough to to call, isn't it? It's a very difficult point to call, but it's worthwhile describing quickly what these regulations are. Are these keeping into and introducing of fish regulations in 2015? It's very specific. And the agency have used this with things like top mouth gudgeon. Yeah. They require somebody to drain a lake and kill everything, and they've done it. Yeah. They haven't done it with sturgeon. Uh, and that's part of the reason is nobody wants to kill a very large animal, which is very valuable to the day ticket fishery because it's helping sell day permits. But it's a problem that should never have arisen in the first place. But the regulations are there, and they're very powerful. Uh, they just haven't been used in this particular context. Now, one of the values of having this website we now have is it draws people in with interesting experiences. Um, and I'll mention two quickly. I have a pet sturgeon, basically. It's a cushion a meat along, right? But it's a very accurate interpretation of a sturgeon. I took it to a public meeting last year, and somebody from the back came along at the end and said, you put it on the floor. I said, why? He said, can I stand across it? Well, of course you can. But well, he's got it between his legs standing across it. He said, mine was bigger than that. So what are you talking about? He said, 2015, I'm cleaning the outside of my ocean-going fishing vessel, ocean-going sailing vessel, rather, in the Medway Estuary at Queenborough. Something went through my legs of this size. I got out of the water very quickly because I was scared. <laughs> now I'm standing above it. I see these things you call scoots on the top of it. That's what it was. Ah. Now, this is because people have interactions with you, but also through our website, we've had two people come to us and say, I'm a bit embarrassed about this. I'm a salmon fisherman. I shouldn't know what I'm doing. I won't tell you where, when, but I have had circumstances where there I am fishing away with my salmon spinner and I snag the bottom and then the bottom starts to move and then it just moves slowly and steadily upstream. I can't turn its head at all. I follow it for 100 meters or more and then the line parts. Now, we don't know where, but those were in rivers that used to have sturgeon in pools that used to have reports from them. Now, those people were both embarrassed because they said, I'm a salmon fisherman. They shouldn't know what I'm doing. And you start to see there are hidden aspects of this, which are really fascinating. And those reports were only as recently as 2010. Yeah. No, it's Maybe it's the odd one there that we know nothing about. No, definitely. It's, they're invaluable, aren't they? And um, like, I, I, was, I was at a, um, a fly fisherman's event uh a couple of weeks ago actually and 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 there was a chap in the audience and he was about 84 and as you I normally I find an excuse to talk about Berber and he came up to me at the end and said oh I caught one of those in the 50s I was like really I've never I've never actually met anyone who's caught one and he said yeah I was a lad and it was like a two pound bird that he was describing and it definitely was one but it's the sort of thing that you're not going to get that data on an online it's the sort of people you've got to kind of root around to find so there probably is more stuff like that but it's 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 finding it isn't it and these these people who are hidden away in the country it it, it's worth saying with our database um from 2000 oh, sorry from 2006 uh, when i first developed our national database we only had 135 records i yeah. said because the newspaper archives went out to 5,000, but all the time you get people phoning in this is where citizen science is so useful you get people phoning in or contact and saying i've seen a photograph on a wall of one in the pub now maybe we know all about it but possibly we don't and it hasn't yeah. been reported any other way. So you're always getting new records coming in from all sorts of intriguing places. Yeah, no, definitely. Well, before we go, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop the million dollar question, um, which is for all for all three of you, if you want to kind of think of this, but why should we have them back? Because obviously that's the first thing anyone ever says when you want to try and reintroduce something. Why bother? What's the point of it? And secondly, when can we expect them back? Which is a, a bigger question in itself, I suppose. So 
I'll let you all yeah. stew that over. <laughs> well, if I could answer the first part of it, why? Yeah. Because they were once there. Yeah. They're, they're a natural part of our wildlife. Yeah. Uh, and they've never really gone away, and they've been trying to make a return for a long time. Francis Francis, who was, um, this is 1878, who was once the curator of uh, 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 the aquarium down at Brighton, said then, if we stop persecuting these animals, as I was saying, with shooting and, and, and forcing them out of the water, we might actually have a breeding population. So they never truly went away, and they've kept trying to come back. And all we're doing now is making it easier for them to do so. Yes, we may go into restocking at some point in the future, but at the moment it's just facilitating what is happening. And they were, and we have now proved it's a native fish. So why not? They have as much right to this country as we do. <laughs> if I could also add, just on a wider habitat ecosystem scale, they're an incredible spe flagship species for um, freshwater, estuarine, coastal and marine conservation. Um, they're charismatic. They have a long lifespan. So they are, they can, they, we hope they will become an emblem of con conserving these interconnected habitats that so, so many diadromous fish rely on, but also fish that, that aren't diadromous. So this, the species life cycle, it symbolizes this, this incredibly important message that we don't always, as conservationists, see these these habitats as connect connected, and um, it's a it's a whole picture. So this species kind of symbolizes that and brings it all together. So um, for that reason as well, we think that it's um, incredibly important. I totally agree with, with uh, both Steve and Hannah, and you know they're an indicator species. They're quite susceptible to changes in the environment and. Um, you know, when you've got them present in the area, you know, that's you know, the systems, I guess, are, you know, they're good systems um, for them to be able to live there. And but also for me, I think I find, you know, working in the marine space um, and underwater, it's always so difficult to um, engage with, um, you know, the, the general public about um, these types of animals and why they're important. And I think having something, you know, Sturgeon or so, that's, as both have said, charismatic species, beautiful species, you know, really, really interesting um, history. And I think they're a, a really great, fascinating way to engage with the general public as well. And I think that helps to raise awareness of not just the species, but also the importance of our river systems and that connectivity, as Hannah mentioned. So, um, yeah, they're, they're a great hook. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Jack, Jack, just come back to your question about when. Um, yeah. This is a complex phase process. We just said we may do restocking one day. But even just taking it from this point, we're in a circumstance now where every year now, two or three animals at least are taken off somewhere off the southwest coast by marine fishermen. So it's probable that there is a regular population in English waters off the southwest at least now, with odd individuals being taken off the Isle of Arran or off the northeast coast of England. So they're around us. They are coming back. And we've had two examples so far of the, I just mentioned one in Queenborough, the mouth of Medway Estuary, another one of, on the mouth of Dovey Estuary in, um, in Wales. Uh, and as the numbers of the French and Germans start to build up, it's very likely that more and more will come. Now, even if we did nothing on those systems where there are no migratory uh, um, obstructions, no major weirs, like the Towie in South Wales, they could just go straight up to potential spawning sites, even if we did nothing. So yeah. this is going to happen itself and what we are doing is observing and facilitating and at some point taking uh, additional action as appropriate but it's going it's happening now basically yeah i think that's one of the most exciting i mean you're preaching to the choir by the way but i think um one, one of the exciting things is that yeah it, it could very well happen on its own but obviously what you're doing is trying to facilitate it and and just give them a, a help i was gonna say helping hand would be helping finn is a better way to put it but just, just... <laughs> just give them a bit of help because um you know if we look at it positively within our lifetimes we um we could see them back which is exciting they're a very charismatic and an amazing creature that you know you mentioned 300 odd pounds i mean that's bigger than most uk sharks and this is something that could be potentially swimming in your local river at, at some point in the future which that would be a hell of a sight it would be phenomenal to see incredible they also yeah. have 
the cutest babies. Oh, they do. <laughs> they do. I will send you a picture, Jack, so that maybe you can post it on the website or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for people to see because you wouldn't think a fish could be so cute, but they are so cute. <laughs> what in what way? Just like the way the mouth is and the eyes and whatnot. They just have these big eyes. And yeah. they, they look like a cartoon character. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, of course, and of course, what a, what a great what a great attraction to the sort of species like this to say a younger audience is this is truly a living dinosaur. It goes back two hundred million years. Yeah. Um, and, and and the kids can see a baby one with all its scoots sticking out, and it looks like a dinosaur. They do. They look pre. They look prehistoric. And what's in fact before we, I will I will end it shortly. The one thing I will go because I know people will ask me about this. What's the whole thing with the crown, or is that a myth? Like you have to present it to. Um... Oh no, that, uh, that that's an interesting legal history. Um, it was uh, Edward II in uh, mm -hmm. 1354, from memory, who made it a royal fish. Right. Um, every fish caught had to be returned to the crown. But if you look at the history of this a little, even in the Magna Carta, there were major complaints about how many fish were being trapped in rivers. Right. And was, we were heavily overfishing fish in rivers that long ago. Edward II made it a royal fish, possibly as a conservation measure. And it's interesting that other royal households across Europe did it at the same time. By oh. about the 14th century, our legislation was changed slightly so that it was only if the animal was taken within three nautical miles of the coast or in our rivers. Anything further off didn't matter. But from that point on, it has been only partly followed. In other words, fish that were taken in the Thames always went to the Crown. Right. A lot of fish in the south of England tended to go to the Crown. You go all over the rest of the country, they were sold to the poor, they were sold to anybody, some of them went into public aquaria, all sorts of history. And that's where sometimes you're trying to track down these individual records by trying to make sure are those two fit two records the same fish when one went to a, a local uh, um, uh, landlord uh, for a big party somewhere and another one went to the crown. Um, so it's actually it's a complex issue. The crown yeah. hadn't actually accepted a surgeon since 1969. Okay, and so you don't you don't need to speak to Charles anytime soon then. Well, no, one of our no, interesting point though, because one of our dialogues in the future may well be with the royal household. Yeah. Because they, we happen to know they feel a little embarrassed about this whole issue, and oh, it's wow. possible it could be seen that they wanted to support conservation of the animal. That dialogue yeah. Yeah, has to be had, but it's it's appropriate. Recently, colleagues of mine from the CSIP, the Cetacean Standings Strandings Investigation Pro Program, um obtained a, a sturgeon that had been landed um to be able to do a post-mortem on it and they had to negotiate with you know talk to really? the crown wow. and make sure that they were okay to that's incredible. i don't know any specifics but i just know that that was part of the process of making sure that they were able to that's mad isn't it that's so crazy but, but, but where, where these things need to be sorted out jack is you can go if you type into um .gov.uk and say, what do I do if I catch a, a surgeon at sea? The MMO med webpage will say, as we would like them to say, please take a good photograph, take some records, and put it back in the water. Yeah. So we're not going to the crown, and the MMO know that, and are you know promoting conservation. So we have to get a, we have to resolve that issue as we go forward a bit of it being a royal fish. Definitely. Uh that makes sense. Um, so let's say if someone's listening to this and they think, you know what, I think I caught a sturgeon or I saw a sturgeon, um, where should they report their records to? I think so. I mean, so for us, there's, there's two, I guess there's two ways. There, there's the one way, as Steve said, on the MMO website, if you're a commercial fisherman, I believe over 15 metres in vessel length, then it should go through that, that process. But, um, you know, it's, it'd be great to have those records come through on our, say, the sturgeon website. It's really simple to use there's just a button right at the top where you can um, click through and fill out all the information and pictures and um, you can tick a box that says it, if they're happy for us to contact them to find out more information and and we gather we get that through our, our systems and we share it with the, the alliance and, and share that data so that we can start to build up that picture um yeah yeah no worries i'll put a link to that in the description so even even if someone thinks it might be an exotic i guess it's still worth sending in because you just never know do you? So it's, yeah. it's all worth uh, all worth sending it in jack it's also worth saying that this is as you say an interesting story as it evolves we'd be very happy to come back at some future point and tell you where we're at because this is yeah. quite a rapidly evolving and interesting story 
yeah no i'm more than happy to waffle about fish i don't need any uh i don't need any encouragement <laughs> at all um well look it's been a pleasure I've, I've not managed to pass out either from cold so that's good but um thanks for coming on jenny hannah and steve and uh and chatting about it so yeah take care thank you for having us thank you so much yes, thank you jack